Okay, right, okay, off we go on light harvesting then. So I think the one thing that you all know from um, GCSE is that plants require chlorophyll to photosynthesize and they're using that light energy from chlorophyll from, um, from the sun absorbed by chlorophyll and they're using that in some mysterious way to generate um, glucose. And we're kind of going to go into the mysteries of the mysterious ways in which chlorophyll accomplishes this. So just a quick reminder of chloroplast structure and then you know where we're coming from. So chloroplasts, nice little double membrane around the outside. Please be impressed by that drawing. Um, and inside the chloroplast we have these sort of uh, membrane bound spaces and these are the thylakoids and they're all embedded in the stroma. So thylakoids, um, I always like to think of them like the sort of soft mint shaped and they're in the, in the stack called the grana. And this um, system of membranes enables sort of compartmentalization of reactions and therefore the grana are going to do the light dependent reactions and the stroma are going to do the light independent reactions. So effectively stroma is going to convert carbon dioxide into glucose and the grana are going to convert water into oxygen and some other stuff. Details to follow in probably another video. So each one of these is called a thylakoid. Please learn how to spell this. And the bit in the middle of a thylakoid is called the inner which I know is a word you've been desperate to use. Now, having said, can you spell it? I can't spell and write at the same time. Thylakoid space. And that whole space is surrounded by a membrane. So, embedded into the membrane, so when you ask for a precise location, this is where they are, the pigments are actually embedded into that phospholipid bilayer. Now notice I've said the word pigments, that means there's more than one, so we're not just going to be talking chlorophyll like you did at GCSE. Um, and they're sort of arranged, if you like, into what's called an antenna complex. So if I'll do another one, just one down here and we'll call that an antenna complex. So if you have been looking through the database of questions, um, which I can recommend to you on the EDUCROSS website, it says, you know, go to question data bank. It would be a really good idea. Do a bit of question practice you will see a couple of questions where you've got an antenna complex drawn like this. It looks like a screwball ice cream with uh, what's called a reaction centre at the bottom. And then it looks like it's got a load of Smarties embedded into it. Should we all just have a screwball embedded with Smarties moment? Mm. And those being the accessory pigments. and the reaction centre containing the primary pigment. And again, if you go on Google and you put in antenna complex, you'll get diagrams that look not dissimilar to that. Um, so that whole thing is called an antenna complex. 
But I found a sort of more modern looking one. Which I thought was lovely. Um, so really these antenna complexes have got accessory pigment molecules down the side. And in the reaction centre here we've got chlorophyll A. So the reaction centre isn't that bit there. That's not the best diagram that you've got, is that then? Mislabeled. Great. So this is the reaction centre. And this is chlorophyll A. Which is the primary pigment. Now primary pigment means that that's going to do something in response to the light. So if we look at what the light's doing, the light's coming in, it's going, the energy is going from pigment molecule to pigment molecule. So all of these and the outside are these accessory pigments. We'll go into what they are in a minute. They're harvesting the light and transferring it into the reaction centre, which is chlorophyll A. And what chlorophyll A does, as you can see here, is this E minus is an electron. They're giving off a high energy electron, which is being accepted by a primary electron acceptor. So these accessory pigments are transferring all that light energy into the reaction centre. Now you can see that I've got two diagrams and they're the same effectively. We've got accessory pigments around the outside, chlorophyll A at the bottom, primary electron acceptor for the electron given off. The difference between these two, these are called photosystems, these two antenna complexes. Photosystem 2 absorbs uh, light at wavelengths P680, so this refers to the reaction centre wavelengths accepted. And photosystem 1 does it at P700. So those are our, that's the, the sort of structure of one of these antenna complexes. Sort of pretty boxy in the middle, chlorophyll A, accepting all that light energy from the accessory pigments. So I'm just going to put that aside for a second and I said that we'd talk about photosynthetic pigments. And this is one of the practicals in your practical book that you should have done or at least be aware of. And this is thin layer chromatography to separate out all of the pigments that form what you called at GCSE chlorophyll. So it's a mixture of pigments. And we can see we've got a mixture of pigments. We've kind of got a, a yellowy kind of colour here. We've then got an olive green, a blue green, a sort of a greyish colour and another sort of yellowy orange colour at the top. So accessory pigments then. What are those yellow ones? So our accessory pigments. You need to know a few names here, I think. We've got xanthophyll. I always put that first, it's my favourite. I think it would make a better call sign than x-ray. Um, we've got carotenoids. which strangely enough for a sort of an orangey yellow colour like a carrot and that olive green patch there is a chlorophyll B and the bluey green one is chlorophyll A. So the principle of thin layer chromatography should you ever have to uh, write about it is you get your thin layer stuff with the chalk on it you put a very dense spot of pigment at what's called the origin and you put this end 
into a solvent making sure that your spots because you can see the outline of that spot around there doesn't touch the solvent what's going to happen then is the solvent is going to rise up through here and as it goes through the origin and goes through that spot it will pick up the components which have different solubilities and rates of movement in that particular solvent and move them different distances of your chromatogram. When your solvent gets new, you would usually do it sort of, you know, your top of your TLC plate to be there. You mark on what's called the solvent front. That's how far the solvent has moved. Now why you would do that is so that you can calculate this RF value, which is a ratio, no units, so that's handy. And for each one of these you would measure how far it's gone in the solvent, how far that component has gone, and divide it by how far your solvent has travelled. And that gives um, a standard, this is a standard value for particular solvents. It uh, doesn't matter how big your chromatogram is, it could be the size of an A4 sheet, it could be the size of an A3 sheet, it could be you know, a little teeny tiny one like you did in class. Um, that ratio is going to be constant no matter how long you leave them for and how big your plate is, which is why it's a ratio. And it just represents how far each bit has travelled. So for this you'd need to do one, two, three, four, five different uh, RF value calculations to be able to identify which of the pigments is which. So that's thin layer chromatography. So, as I we do the functions of those, um, so if you remember what these accessory pigments are doing, collecting all the light energy transferring it into the chlorophyll A at the reaction centre. So what we get are, um, is a graph called the absorption spectrum. So this tells us how much light at each wavelength has been absorbed by each sort of pigment. So <clears throat> we can see the chlorophyll A is this sort of fairly sort of pale green line bit of a peak sort of between violet and blue. Doesn't really absorb any much, anything very much at green and yellow and orange and has a sort of little peak in between orange and red. So if it was just chlorophyll A and just a reaction centre we wouldn't be able to absorb very much, or the plant wouldn't be able to absorb very much light. You can see that the accessory pigment, so chlorophyll B, has got a peak a bit further over than the chlorophyll A. Again, not much going on during the green-yellow bit, but absorbing a little bit between yellow and orange. And the carotenoids, lovely peak at sort of 490, and then not really absorbing very much. So what this does, what having these accessory pigments does, is it uh, enables a wider range of wavelengths of light. To be absorbed. We can also construct, uh, if we look at the, the, you know, sort of what you would measure really, I suppose, would be the rate of photosynthesis by measuring oxygen production. You can refer to the lovely video of bubbles of oxygen coming off Kabumba. Or the uh, rate of carbon dioxide absorption. Again, you might have done that with algae balls and bicarbonate indicator. And what you get is an, what we call an action spectrum. So. This lovely graph here, because you're measuring absorption, is called an absorption spectrum. Spectrum refers to the colours of light along the bottom, you know, the Richard of York or whatever you learnt. And 
This is an action spectrum, which is the rate of photosynthesis. And here we've got the spectrum along the bottom. And you can see that the peaks on the action spectrum correspond to the location of the peaks on the absorption spectrum. This is not accidental. So this close correlation so close correlation, what does that tell us? That the wavelengths absorbed are used in photosynthesis. And of course they're not absorbing any of this green light, that's all being reflected back into your eyes and looking, making a plant look green, so those wavelengths are not absorbed. Okay, if you should be asked to draw either of these spectra in an exam. You're not going to try and draw anything as complicated as that. Obviously, you need to label your axes. So, wavelength of light, nanometers. You might be clever enough to put peaks on, and we've got peaks at about 690 and at about 480. And depending on whether you're doing action or absorption, you want relative absorption or uh, rate of photosynthesis at the side. And you can simplify this into peak, trough, smaller peak. And that works for both of them, so you sort of red end, slightly lower peak than the blue end has. Uh, I'm I'm kind of out of information about life harvesting now. <laughs>